car crashes, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts with host David Lamb and the attorneys of Hollis Wright. Hello and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Got a really interesting show and some of the, the uh, topics of conversation that we're going to cover are ripped right from the headlines. So you're going to want to stick around for sure tonight. We'll introduce our panel of experts coming up. But first, a couple of uh, details that I think you're going to find interesting. First of all, to join our conversation, which we would love for you to do, uh, just follow the information at the bottom of your screen. It's going to be there all throughout the program tonight, so easy for you to communicate with us and join the conversation. And Hollis Wright makes available attorneys standing by live. Every, uh, every time we're here for the attorneys, they are standing by live to speak with you. That's a confidential and off-air call text. However, uh, is easiest for you to communicate with them. They are standing by uh, live to speak with you. So take advantage of that opportunity for the next half hour. Leading our conversation tonight is uh, Michael Eldridge from Hollis Wright. Good to see you, sir. It's good to see you, David. Good to be here tonight. And uh, got a good good topic to talk about. We do. Yeah, a lot of ground to cover here. Yeah, we do. It's something that's been in the news. And it's, it's one of those things that at some point in time in our life, whether it be us or someone that we know or someone we're close to is going to have to deal with. And there's a lot of questions and a lot of information that we need. And we're talking about criminal law, and uh, it is it is a, something that just comes up. And we've got an expert here to talk about it because the attorneys at Hollis Wright, we, we admittedly do not have all the answers. So we have Victor Revel with the Revel Law Firm, and you are an expert, and this is what you do for a living. Victor, tell us a little bit about what y'all do at the Revel Law Firm. Well, first, thanks for having me here. Uh, really great to be here with you, Michael and uh, David. Um, so uh, we do criminal defense work. Uh, any, anytime anybody gets charged with a crime or if they are accused of something, we can represent that person. And uh, we do that all day, every day. Uh, love doing it. Got a great staff, great team, great team of lawyers and, uh, and a support staff. And, you know, we, we do a really good job at it. <laughs> we, yeah. we believe in finding a good fight and being, right. being a voice for the voiceless because when you go in court, nobody's listening to you. But if you have someone willing to, to, uh, to give your side of the story, it makes all the difference. That's important. And, you know, so as a litigator that's on the other side and it, that does civil work and mostly uh, tractor-trailer cases, I, I get these, you know, Alabama Uniform Traffic Crash Reports. And a lot of times in these automobile accidents, there are criminal elements to it. And I'll see where an officer says something at the bottom, you know, an arrest, you know, uh, went to go get an arrest warrant to arrest this driver. What, what is that process? What does that mean when they say, because you see people get arrested on TV all the time, oh, yeah, and, then, yeah, yeah. and then now there's an arrest warrant. What's the difference in that? How does, how does the police go about getting an arrest warrant? What's the process there? So to get an arrest warrant, basically the officer must have what's called probable cause. Um, it got to be probable cause that this officer has the reasonable belief that this person committed some offense. And it could be from an accusation. Somebody told him, hey, this person did this. You know, we have it all the time. Uh, this person raped me. Um, and so um, the officer has probable cause. If he believes this this this, uh, this alleged victim and uh, arrest that person. It could be a DUI. Somebody get pulled over, and the officer believes that hey, I, I got reasonable belief that you you've been driving under influence of alcohol or drug because you know the, the glossy eyes or uh, or or you blow in the sobriety you blow in the, um, the breathalyzer and you blow a you know a .09. So it's just that reasonable belief. If they have that reasonable belief, they can go and uh, get swear out a warrant with a magistrate or a judge and. Uh, a person gets arrested. Okay, and we, a lot of times I hear, and, and, and people will ask me, you know, the, the police said I have to come down to the station and talk to them. <laughs> you know, what should I do? And I always am uncomfortable because I'm like, I don't do this for a living, but it, it, that's, an, that's an intimidating situation, right, where the police yeah. say you yeah. have to come do this. Um, is that is that a fact? Do you, do you have to speak with the police? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> no. You always got the right. So we have our Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. We don't got to we don't got to talk to anybody. You know, we don't have to go give any statements whether you're innocent or guilty. Sometimes there's a stigma. that's like, OK, well, if you don't go talk to law enforcement, you must be guilty. No. I don't want to go talk law enforcement because I don't want to go talk law enforcement. Right. Um, because a lot of times, so, you know, these officers, they're trying to do their job. Uh, these detectives, they have a, a duty to try to get down to what's going on. But you'll go down there against a trained professional and you'll answer their questions and you may say something that, that you, in a certain way that you didn't mean it like that or you weren't trying to say this, but now because of your answer, 
that may give this officer probable cause to arrest you. Right. And, and that could be a very uh, horrible situation. So you never got to go. But you should always consult an attorney before going. If you're going right. to like, hey, I want to go or whatever, talk to an attorney first, talk to somebody who knows about this, and then make that decision. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you something? His response to that question, the way he was laughing, I just thought that this is um, curious to me. When you watch those police shows and <laughs> movies, because like what Michael asked, I mean, to a layperson like me, you know, well, I'm, they want to talk to me and they're the police, right? <laughs> so yeah. is it frustrating for you, first of all, and second of all, does do, do television shows and movies and the way they portray the process make your job harder? Um, I think that, uh, I don't know if it make it harder or not, because people see different things in different movies that, that show, you know, people going out and saying something. Some people going out and say something stupid. Right. Some people not going. Most times, people don't go get an attorney. They just go there and start talking, and, right. and yeah. they get themselves in, in the situation. So, I mean, it's hilarious, because I deal with it a lot, and there's so many cases wherein somebody gets charged, and it's based off them just going down there, starting talking, and they may not have anything to do with it at all, or they may not have done anything wrong. They may not be guilty of what they're charged with, but because they went out and started talking, now they have put themselves in a situation that they otherwise would not have been in had they had consulted an attorney and, and, and also just exercise their Fifth Amendment right to remain silent yeah. because yeah. the Miranda rights people talk about, the right to remain silent, uh, the right to have an attorney with you, uh, the, 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 the right to... Um, what else? Against so self-incrimination. Self-incrimination, all that, all that Miranda rights stuff, people have that, but right. it, it seems like people forget that when, when, yeah. when, when law enforcement get in their face. I, you oh, know, I, I, it's stressful, I, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> I, I deal with it with, with clients and depositions where I, you know, I say, the less you say is better, right? Answer their questions, but only answer what they say, because if they're asking, they want something from you. That's you know? right. And, 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 it, and it may not be in a bad way, right? Like you said, they're doing your job, but it may not be in your best interest, and maybe you need to talk to an attorney, and that's... That's a very important thing for people to remember that you have the right to talk to an attorney. It doesn't mean that you're you're not talking to law enforcement or you're or you're doing something wrong, but you have the right to think about yourself first before you just go down to the station and talk to a detective who, like you said, is is trained um, in in these types of matters. A question we got here: Do I have the right to object to a warrantless search? Absolutely. Uh, I've ran that situation before. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> uh, but absolutely. Um, so you have, we have this thing called the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that says that for you to get searched, they got to have some type of warrant. Um, and if you're in vehicles, there's this thing called probable cause. And a lot of times, people deal with this warrantless search when they're in vehicles. Because the officer's saying, hey, do you mind if I search your car? You have the right to say no. You always have the right to withhold your consent. And you can say, okay, well, you can check the inside of the car, but not the trunk. You can, you can limit um, your, your consent as well, but you always have the right to, to withhold your consent. You always have the right to say no to a search. Now, that doesn't mean get in the way. Like, uh, you, uh, officers say, man, I search your vehicle, and you say no. And then officers try to go in your vehicle, and you, you hit the hand away. Now, that's where you get in trouble. <laughs> like, you don't want to do that, but yeah. you can always say no. Okay. Yeah. Time for us to step aside. Our first break, covering some good uh, ground here with Michael and Victor. Uh, if you have questions or um, information you'd like to get to us, questions maybe we can pass along, feel free to take advantage of that opportunity to do so. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. Stay with us. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm, and thank you for watching The Attorneys. We hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple, to provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free and all fair. So if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury topics, call, email, or text us. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, or go to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us button. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and watching The Attorneys. The Attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. When we started the show eight years ago, my hope was we would be able to do what we do best, which is to 
help people answer real world legal related issues they have in their life. People oftentimes are confronting various legal issues and problems in their lives that range across the gamut of legal practice areas, bankruptcy, criminal law, family law, just to name a few. And to be able to have a 30 minute platform or format to where we can just cover various legal topics once a week uh, that's obviously the primary focus of the show. That we would be able to use the resources of the many lawyers we have at this law firm to create a plan that had a lasting impact that also gave back to the community at the same time. And I think we've done just that with the attorneys. Welcome back to the attorneys talking about criminal law tonight. If you know somebody that needs to hear this conversation, might want to give them a call and say, hey, listen up. Uh, interesting conversation uh, we're having tonight. Would love to have you join that conversation. Remember, attorneys from Hollis Wright are standing by live all throughout the program tonight. All you have to do is give them a call. Michael? Yeah, Victor, you, when we went to break, you were talking about things that you should and shouldn't do in terms of detectives and police officers uh, and things that you, you your rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that's come up in the news are, uh, has nothing to do with criminal law, but it has to do with voting in Georgia and that you, they're requiring you to show a voter ID. What about or, or that your personal ID, yeah. like a driver's license? What are, in terms of police officers, if a police officer approaches you and says, I need to see your identification, do you have to show it to them? Do they have the right to demand to see your identification? It depends. So if you're in a vehicle, if you are driving the vehicle, the law says that you must show them your license. People are like, well, why do you want to see my license? I don't want to show it to you. No, brother, you, uh, you show that you show also your license because the law says you have to. Um, if you're just walking, if you're just walking about um, and the officer says, hey, I want to see your ID. You do not have to give them your, your, your license in the state of Alabama. Now you have to identify yourself if they ask for your name. You have to give your address if they ask for your address. You have, they, it also says in that statute that you have to state your business. So if they can give you, ask for an explanation of your actions. You can say, also, I'm just walking. Now, you must counter that with your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, because you always had a right to remain silent. But if they can identify who you are, and they believe you've done something wrong or possibly involved in something, they may have taken out of the station to figure out who you are. So you have a right to remain sound. The Alabama law says you have to identify yourself if they just stop you and they ask you who you are. Um, I would say do that. The only reason I would just remain silent if there's just something like, it's not, I don't think it's my best interest to talk right now, because you have that Fifth Amendment right, and this state law cannot be higher than your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. That's right. It can't be harder. The, the federal law trumps the state law. That's Let me right. ask you this in, in terms of federal law and the Second Amendment. I always wonder because I always see they say so and so got picked up on gun charges. And I, I always think to myself, well, I thought, it, thought we were allowed to carry around guns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when are you, apparently that's not true. You can't just carry around any gun or, or if you can, that there, there are some processes. What, what is the process of making it legal to carry around a gun and, and the types of guns, if, if you can tell us? Yeah, um, so on the, Second Amendment, on the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, we know we have the right to bear arms. And so what the courts have said is you, have the, you, can, you can have a, your gun, you can have open carry on, you can walk around with your gun on you as long as it's not concealed. Can't be under your shirt, can't be under your jacket. Open carry is fine, but open carry is you're walking around with it. You can't be riding in a vehicle. It's not open carry if you're riding a vehicle because that gun is concealed at that point. And so you have to have a license to carry that concealed weapon. So here in the state of Alabama, if you want to walk around with your gun on you, which you have that right, go get a license to carry it first. If you are going to conceal it, if you're going to walk around open with it, no license is needed. No, no license is needed at all. Now this is the thing. That deals with pistols, okay? A shotgun, that's not a pistol, okay? You can't so, conceal it, or it's tougher to conceal. That's right, but, and, but you can have a shotgun in your vehicle without, without there being any issue um, at all. You can have your shotgun, that's not an issue because it's not a pistol, so that's not, that's not gonna be a violation of Alabama law. One thing to remember though, so sometimes people go buy guns at these gun stores, and when they go to buy this gun, they may not have a license to carry a concealed weapon at that point. If you want to be able to get it back to your home without breaking the law, make sure it's unloaded, make sure it's in the trunk. And you can't have access to the trunk 
from inside the vehicle. If you have access, then you can't, you can't do that because it has to be in a different compartment that's locked up and you can't have access to it from a passenger compartment inside of the vehicle. It's a lot of, a lot of legalese there, and, but and that's I assume how it goes. That, I assume this changes state to state as well. So oh, yeah, every yeah, state's yeah. going to be different. So that's that's something to, that people need to think about before they go over, you know, into another state with. So with so if if I am licensed to carry a gun in Alabama and I go and I get pulled over in Georgia, does that go with me? I think it has to go under Georgia's law. Under Alabama law, so if we do, if we turn that the opposite okay. way, right. if somebody from Georgia came over to Alabama and they got a license for, in Georgia and they mm -hmm. come over to Alabama, Alabama will uphold that license. Okay. They will say, okay, you got a Georgia license, you are good. All right. Now, if you go over to Georgia, you got to follow by Georgia's rules. You know, yeah. they say, uh, what, when in Rome, you got to do what the Romans yeah. do. Uh, so, um, <laughs> I, I don't know what Georgia law say, but right. Alabama law, you come over here to this state, you're good. What about, as long as you have a license. Are there certain, are there certain folks who cannot um, carry a gun regardless of, of you know, whatever the, the law says about that? Um, are there, are there so, folks excluded from uh, being able to carry a, a gun? Good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so if you have a felony conviction or if you have a domestic violence conviction, that could be felony, or misdemeanor, you are not allowed to carry a gun. That's okay. that's under that's under federal law combined with state law. Okay. So under federal law, any felony conviction whatsoever, you're giving them those gun rights. Now, if you get a pardon, then that's different. You can get you if you get a full pardon where you get those gun rights back, you can. Also, um, there are individuals that have um, uh, some 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 access one diagnoses uh, where they can't carry. So it's if some of the people that have some severe mental conditions, they're not going to be allowed to carry a gun. It's going to violate both federal and state law. And so that's something that people usually don't think about, but that comes up and people get charged with that. So, that, and that's going to, and that usually deals with something like someone that has um, been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. That's one of the access one diagnoses that you can run into an issue with that. So you got to think about that. Okay, um, we got like less than a minute, but one other thing before we t get off of the whole gun issue. Um, a lot of states are making, uh, making uh, increasing gun laws and, and all of that, kind of tightening those restrictions. Yes. Is Alabama doing much on that front? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's a quick answer. I mean, like I'm gonna tell you, Alabama is, you know, in this state, People really love their yeah. gun rights. It seems pro-gun, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, so I don't, I don't see anything going against guns. I, I think it's like, hey, this is, this is Alabama. We, got, we, we enjoy our right to bear arms in the right. Second Amendment. You know, I don't think nobody's messing with that. I think yeah. you lose a lot of political points right. if you do that. Yeah, and, uh, so. and you ain't going to be in office too long. Yeah, yeah. All, all the hunters around here <laughs> yeah. take exception. <laughs> all right, time for us to step aside. This is our final break of the evening. So just a few minutes remaining if you want to join our conversation. Also, a reminder, Hollis Wright, all over social media. So wherever you are, they are. Just search Hollis Wright and you'll find them there. Stay tuned. The final segment of The Attorney is coming right up. I'm attorney Carter Clay with Hollis Wright Law Firm. If you've ever been involved in a civil lawsuit or been a witness to an accident, then you may have been asked to give deposition testimony. In this week's Legal 411, we are answering the question, what is a deposition and why am I being asked to give one? Depositions involve the process of a person giving under oath testimony that is outside of court. The person giving deposition testimony is referred to as the deponent. Depositions are taken in the presence of a court reporter and the court reporter records the testimony. After the deposition, the attorneys for the parties received a typed transcript that contains all the questions that were asked by the attorneys as well as the answers given by the deponent. The purpose of taking depositions is to ensure that the attorneys for the parties have a full and complete understanding of the events giving rise to the lawsuit as well as an understanding of the testimony that they can expect to hear from witnesses at trial. Another reason an attorney might want to get deposition testimony is that it allows the attorneys to better prepare for trial and to develop a strategy for presenting the case to a judge or a jury. At trial, the deposition testimony can be used in several ways. 
First, if a witness on the stand deviates from the deposition testimony, an attorney can use the deposition to impeach the witness. Also, if a witness forgets certain facts or events, the deposition can be used to refresh the witness's recollection. Finally, in some instances when a witness simply cannot attend trial, the trial judge has the authority to allow the deposition testimony to be read to the jury. If you are a party to a lawsuit and are requested to give deposition testimony, your attorney will likely spend a significant amount of time preparing you for the deposition process to put you at ease and make you feel comfortable. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching the attorneys on WVTM 13. Welcome back into the attorneys. Our final segment remaining less than seven minutes. So if you want to speak with those attorneys from Hollis Wright who are standing by live, you've got less than seven minutes to do so. Michael. Victor, one of the things we talked about tonight is when to speak and when you have to speak. Um, what about when you're in custody? You've been arrested, you've been charged, you've got a trial date and, and you're sitting in whether it be the Jefferson County Jail or any jail in the state of Alabama. Can they listen to you, right? You're, they're in your custody, and you, you, you call your, your girlfriend or you call mama. Um, are those conversations, are they protected? No, they're not. Uh, better be careful what you say old Sally on the phone and, and mama because all of that will be used against you. You cannot just, you don't have that, that right to, um, that right of privacy. If you're using a jail phone, and it says on there, this phone call may be recorded. It, it should is say, being recorded. Yeah, look, I, it, it should say, this call is being recorded, you know, because every single one of them there are, and you got to be very, very careful because you can say something that can inherently hurt your case. It could be totally just irrelevant, but it's something that you said, and now those words can be used against so, you in court. So they can use that in trial, the things you say in these phone calls after you've been arrested? Absolutely, okay. no doubt. Now, in terms of your, your attorney, though, if you talk to them on the phone, that's a different story. That right? is different. That's a protected communication. I think attorneys should be mindful that they're on the jail call and that call can still be listened to. Not supposed to be not listened to. Under the law, it's not supposed to be. That's a protected communication. Um, that would not be used in a court of law against that, that individual. Um, but attorneys should try to find different ways like we have zoom we can we can have zoom conferences with our clients and if they're in the jail we can go to the jail to see them i try to stay away from uh, information dealing with their case on those jail calls but it is protected understood interesting question uh, switching gears here talking about th this question is about prescription pills and traveling um you guys are way too young to have a, a daily pill and vitamin divider uh, <laughs> but us old folks have those if you travel with that and you don't have the prescription should th the question is about if if they're asked about that they're, they're not carrying their prescription is that a cause for concern that's a big cause for concern because let's say a person is pulled over and officer sees some pills in the car your bottle is it's not in there it doesn't have your name on it officers don't have time to be calling the pharmacy calling right. the doctor to see if you actually have a prescription for for hydrocodone or or some other narcotic drug right and so at that time that you may get arrested for illegal possession of prescription drug which is a misdemeanor or unlawful possession of controlled substance which is a class d felony oh, wow. and now you got to go through this whole process of going to jail getting bunded out and you had a valid prescription. The courts will figure it out. It'll get worked out later on, but now you've had to go to jail and get money out and your whole day is ruined. Right. So, so you advise just travel with your prescription if you? Yes. That's if you're gonna be traveling, make sure you got the make sure you got the, the pill that the, the pill bottle that right. has your information on it, or at least a, the actual prescription so you can prove that hey, I'm not just you know popping pills, right. I'm not carrying yeah. something illegally, I have a right to have this. So David was asking about old people questions. I want to ask you about young people questions. Okay. Uh, so, David is young, by the way. You know, I, <laughs> at heart. Well this this would be a good question for you. Um, I, I, you hear people all the time talk about well they were a minor, meaning that they were under eighteen. But, but they were arrested. Are there different rights uh, in the state of Alabama or just generally in terms of me as an adult over the age of 18 or I think 19 is age majority in Alabama and someone who gets arrested for a crime that's, that is under the age or is not an adult? 
So generally you deal with that at the age of 17 years of age. That's when you get those, um, that super Miranda. Even though in the state of Alabama, 19 the age majority, um, you get treated as an adult at the age of 18. Um, when you get arrested, or people get arrested for various offenses. But when someone is 17 or younger, a lot of times they're able to go through the juvenile court system. And that seals the record so the public can't look at, look at it because things happen when we are younger, young and dumb, or just make mm -hmm. um, careless, I played the fifth. Okay. <laughs> yeah. People do people do certain things. Yeah. So you have what's called those super random rights. You have a right to remain silent, right to have a lawyer there. You also have the right to have a parent there as well. Okay. As opposed to just a regular Miranda. All right. So real quick, 30 seconds. Uh, a question here. Uh, my senior in high school is dating a sophomore in high school. Should I be worried? Your answer, I guess, is yes. Yes, definitely <laughs> yeah. worried. That senior needs to know that in the state of Alabama, the age of consent, if they're going to have these sexual relations, is 16. And so if they are doing something that they shouldn't be doing, but if they're doing something with someone that's a 15 years of, 15 years of age, the law is you cannot be more than two years older than that person. If you're two years and a day and, and older than that individual, then you can get charged with rape second, which is considered statutory rape. So that is very important that they know that. Yeah. We are just about out of time, under two minutes, but I want to give both of you uh, time for a final thought. And Victor, if you would, you go first, please. Sir. Well, first of all, thank you once again for having me here. Um, my firm, we do criminal offense work. We absolutely love it. People get charged with many things. And I think the, the misconception is just because someone is charged with a crime, they must be guilty. And that's not right. People get charged all the time that are not guilty. And the system, the system is designed to, to save that innocent person. They say, they say that it's better that 99, 99 guilty go free than that one innocent person be sent to prison. And we have to look at the situation where if someone is arrested that they are not presumed guilty, that they are, that they are innocent until proven guilty. And that's a big thing. My firm believes in that. And, and uh, we love doing criminal offense work. And we go all over the state. And, would love to help as many people as possible. Well, Victor, the big takeaway that I had tonight is that people have the right to talk to a lawyer before they talk to law enforcement or before they do something that law enforcement tells them to do. And I think people need to understand that it's not going to cost them money just to call and get a, answer a question to make sure that they're protecting themselves. So I think that's very good. I appreciate you coming on because I think this is very informative yeah, well, uh, for our audience. A whole lot of good ground covered. Good to see you again, you as well. Victor. Yeah. Thanks for being with us. Michael, great job uh, as always. And as we wrap things up, uh, a neat thing, I just want to, Victor covered a lot of ground that's really helpful. Maybe you know someone who needs to hear it. If you just Google search Hollis Wright, it'll take you to our website. All the shows are there. So this is a show that if you know somebody who needs to hear this, and uh, of what was covered, just be sure and share it with them. Thanks so much as always. We really appreciate you being with us each and every Sunday night. We'll see you next time right here on The Attorneys. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.